let's talk about where we are, though. 22 days out from the election. The, the dynamic in my mind has vastly shifted. Coming out of the convention, it was all joy and vibes, according to the Democrats. And then I believe that Democrats kept waiting for Kamala Harris to give them a reason. And they finally said, okay, there's no there there. And now you're seeing this shift. They are, they, the Harris campaign is on defense this last 22 days. And Donald Trump has retaken the the wave of enthusiasm and excitement heading into the final three weeks of this election. Sure, and I, I totally agree with your analysis. Really what they were trying to do was to copy the Obama campaign where he offered us hope and change, but no specifics. So it was a vibe he was selling. And after the Bush presidency, perhaps they thought that would work and, and it did. So I guess they thought they could sell us joy without any specifics. The problem is that voters are now beginning to focus on the real Kamala Harris and they find her vacuous. Uh, they, they start to look at her positions. Yeah, she wanted to defund the police. She wanted to make entering the country illegally no longer a crime. She wanted you and I and every American taxpayer to pay for the health care for the, what is it, 20 million people who have entered the country illegally? If we did that, we wouldn't be able to pay for health care for anyone. So I think people are beginning to focus on the fact that she doesn't have the qualifications, the intelligence, or any plan whatsoever other than what she unbelievably admitted this past week is she would do nothing whatsoever different than Joe Biden. So how is, that, that, how is she a change agent? Don't you find that mind blowing that, that I, I cannot believe as a former staffer that you send your boss out and the most fundamental question is what would you do differently? You know, how do you answer for the last four years and you can't name a single thing? I just, I found it a dereliction of duty on behalf of her staff to not have an answer ready to go. She does a media tour that's supposed to move the needle forward. And yet to your point, all we're talking about is the flubs. Yeah, I think there's they got two different problems. One, I, I think the president in the debate, uh, when he said, let me tell you folks a secret, Joe Biden hates her. I, I think he's absolutely right. So Biden now is a loose cannon. They'd be very careful what they say about him because he's very bitter about the way he was pushed aside uh, by Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. Uh, and the fact that he got 17 million votes. He got 71% of the vote in the Democrat primaries and caucuses, and nobody voted for her. So they're trying to minimize any damage that Biden can do to them in the final days. We've already seen him, as you know, rush to the press room in the White House, where he's never been, not even once during his presidency, to beat her to the punch in announcing the end of the long, longshoremen's strike. Uh, when she tried to call Governor DeSantis to talk about the hurricane relief, he wouldn't return his call, uh, her call. And when asked why, he said, well, I'm dealing with the president of the United States. Why should I deal with her? And then Biden said, I've been talking to the governor. He's doing a great job. So that's once again undercutting Kamala. I'm not sure he wants her in his lucid moments. I'm not sure that he wants her to win. I agree. There's something about... I mean, he stepped on her press conference the other day. I think he wants to show, see, it wasn't me, right? Because if she wins, it proves the narrative that he just needed to get out of the way. If she loses, he can say, see, it wasn't me. It's all of us. Well, in that performance, on, I think it was The View, when he's asked why he didn't run again, he kind of looks at the floor, he seems uncomfortable, and he said, you know, my poll numbers were every bit as good as hers are today. I mean... I thought I could beat the guy, meaning Trump. Uh, my poll numbers were no worse than theirs, but some in the party, you know, thought I should get out, weren't sure I could win, and maybe it was time to make make room for younger people. Uh, I still think he's, he's rightfully very bitter. Uh, they pushed him aside. They did so in a brutal manner. Uh, they embarrassed him. Uh, I'm not sure he wants her to win. He's a loose cannon here in the last... 20 some odd days. Yeah. Not only that, they treated him horribly, but then they haven't even tried to act to show him any, you know, modem of respect since then. They've literally been like, we, you know, you don't need to show up anywhere. We got this. And, and I think that he, you know, he felt like he got 
pushed aside to your point, and then he's been treated very badly since then. You would think that someone would say, hey, thanks for doing this. We want to respect your decision and what you've done for the party, and we're going to kind of highlight your service and make you seem like the elder statesman that you want to be. Instead, it's, hey, Joe, stay in the corner. We're going to put you there, and we'll bring you out after the election for, the, for you know, maybe a, a victory lap. Sean, can you imagine having the sitting president of the United States have his his final convention speech to a Democrat national convention speaking after midnight on Monday night and then telling him to get out of town so he's not even there for the nomination of his successor? It, no it former rude. president has been treated like that. And uh, let's point out who is not campaigning for Kamala. That would be Jill Biden. Jill has, uh, I'm told, declined any uh, any request. So they roll out Barack Obama last week. That was a disaster because all he does is engage in race baiting, telling people, well, if you're black, you have to vote for her. Why? A, she's not black. And B, uh, black men can think for themselves. They, they don't need Barack Obama to tell them how to vote. I thought that was a gigantic mistake. Uh, there, I don't think they'll take Hillary Clinton out on the campaign trail. If they do, they're going to find out that she continues to be one of the most hated people in the entire country. It is interesting. I'm glad you brought up the Jill Biden thing. She's so bitter. And you're, you're, you're right about this combination. They are mad at her. And if Jill Biden really cared about her husband's legacy, she'd be out there saying, we need to vote for the first woman. We need to do this. Say a lot of the things that Kamala can't. But Gavin Newsom, where's he been? Where's Gretchen? I mean, aside, I, I want to talk about the Gretchen Whitmer thing, but actually, let's just do it now. Gretchen Whitmer, and I know that you're a convert to Catholicism. The ad that Gretchen Whitmer did for her, and I'll just show it to the audience now. I mean, this is disgusting, Roger. I, 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 I. I don't know. I can't. I feel like every time I get outraged, someone says to me, really, you now that you draw the line. But this is absolutely appalling to every Catholic, the way that they have dealt with the Holy Eucharist. And yet the media just allowed that to go. The Kamala Harris campaign didn't have to answer it. And you have Gretchen Whitmer handing a Dorito to some leftist feminist from Canada in this in, in sort of a depiction of, of the Eucharist and I, I cannot believe there was no more outrage on this. Yeah, I, I saw it. I showed it to my watch, my wife last night. It's really, really offensive. Uh, it's unbelievably offensive. But look, these people, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in organized religion. They don't respect our belief in God. So uh, I guess they thought this was clever or funny or this would somehow get them votes. I, I don't quite get it. But remember, these are the same people who think the endorsement of Dick Cheney, a man who lied our way into war, who claimed that the Iraqis had met weapons of mass destruction, who claimed that that the Iraq was involved uh, in 9-11, which of course they weren't, they seem to think that his endorsement, because he's a Republican, shows bipartisan support. I think it is a bad misreading of the country. Sean, the most exciting thing that's going on right now, I think in politics, is the realignment in which common sense Democrats and independents like Robert Kennedy, uh, like Tulsi Gabbard, like Rod Blagojevich, they're supporting Donald Trump because it is a throwback to the old Democrat party that believed in capitalism, free enterprise, a strong national defense, uh, uh, a party that, uh, that was fundamentally patriotic. Yeah, that maybe the Democrats wanted to spend more and tax more than we did, but but they still believed in America. That Democrat party simply no longer exists. The party has been taken captive by a group of Marxists uh, and other screwballs. So there is a realignment uh, going on. As far as I'm concerned, they can have the warmongers. Uh, I'd rather have uh, the, the Justice League, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, Robert <laughs> Kennedy, uh, Donald Trump, uh, Tucker Carlson. Uh, that's the camp I'm in. I did get a fact, a kick out of the fact that when Liz Cheney endorsed her, Kamala Harris looked at her and said, I'm honored to have your endorsement. And I looked at somebody that I know and I said, so tell me two years ago that Kamala Harris would have ever said that about a Cheney. They used to def you know, talk about how these people, the Cheneys were the worst possible people and they were warmongers, as you mentioned. They were right wing nut jobs. And now suddenly they're honored to have their endorsement. 
I mean, it, I, I just don't know who they think that they're helping when they say that. I think they're seeing things in old terms. In other words, yes. they see it as bipartisan support. Oh, look, we have these Republicans. Republican Democrat is not how the country breaks down anymore. Today, it's about those who are in uh, and an outsider. Donald Trump is an outsider. Even though he served four terms uh, as pre four years as president, he remained an outsider. Uh, and it, it is his outsider agenda. You know him well, Sean. He can't be bullied. He can't be bossed. No one tells him what to think. No one tells him where to go. No one tells him what to do. He's fiercely independent. Uh, he's genuine. He's authentic. That's why he got elected. That's what people want. The, uh, partisanship, uh, I think, is behind us. We're in a post-partisan political period. People don't, don't, don't decide by Republican, Democrat. I mean, obviously some do, but most people are voting for the policies and the person. Uh, and this is where I, I think Donald Trump shines. Anyone who looks at Kamala Harris will determine she's literally unqualified uh, to be president. And when you begin to look at some of her decisions, her record, for example, uh, as a prosecutor, her prosecution of this woman, Shari Peoples, whose daughter was missing from school because she had sickle cell anemia. And at 12 years old, she had a debilitating stroke. Uh, yet, despite the fact that Shari Peoples, the, the black mother who was innocent, provided all this documentation to the schools, Kamala Harris still wanted to put her in jail because her sick daughter was in the hospital and therefore not able to go to public school. Yeah, they, they went after her for truancy, as if she was hanging out on a street corner. She had health care issues. The mother was bending over backwards to care for her. And they go after her for her daughter's, quote, truancy. And I'm thinking to myself, that shows I mean, who in their right mind, regardless of party, does that to another person. And that was a badge of honor for Kamala Harris. No wonder people worry about her, her judgment. Well, she actually used it, you know, as a centerpiece of her campaign for attorney general. So she destroyed the life of this black woman and her daughter, and they're still struggling uh, for political gain to try to make an issue out of it. Then later, she does an interview with uh, on The Breakfast Club with uh, Charlemagne the God. And he says, well, did anybody actually go to jail? She says, no, no, nobody did. Well, this woman did go to jail. It is really disgraceful. I want to get back to, to where we are 22 days out. She's got this problem w with black men and she's going on all, she went on Roland Martin's show. She's going on these other podcasts and shows catering to black men. She's rolling out an agenda for them, talking about some of the healthcare issues that are unique to black men that she'll address. She's talking about small business loans with $20,000 forgivable. I, I, it blows my mind that we're 22, 22 days out of an election. And it's the Democrats, the Democrats with a black candidate that are trying to figure out how to get to black men and that they are coming to Donald Trump, who the Democrats paint as this racist, horrible person. And they, the Democrats, have to admit they have a big problem with this demographic that has been so on their side since your I mean, since Nixon. I mean, the bottom line is this at this particular hour, if you believe the polling, uh, Donald Trump's going to put up the best performance with black voters since Richard Nixon back in 1960, not 68 since 1960. That's 64 years ago. Among Hispanic voters, Donald Trump's going to put up the best performance for Republicans since 2004 and George W. Bush. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. In 1960, Nixon got literally a third of the African-American vote. That's running against John F. Kennedy. It now appears that Donald Trump is poised to perform as well, if not slightly better. Uh, that's really historic. Uh, also true, as you know, is we're actually leading, could get an absolute majority of Hispanic voters. The previous high water mark there for a Republican was under George W. Bush. I think it was around 38 percent, which at the time we thought was really great. <laughs> right. So if they have to worry about their base, uh, that tells you a lot about what's going to happen uh, in this election. I think but the doesn't that also tell you a lot about what's going on, though, in the media, that there's this perception whether it's Hispanics, as you mentioned, or black, we have to cater to them. And if a candidate, I saw it yesterday, Kristen Welker, what are you doing to get to them? 
And, and this goes back to, I think, the difference between how we communicate. You and I, I think, agree that we talk about values to Americans, all Americans, and say, we're going to make this country better, safer, more prosperous. The way that the media and the Democrats believe is that we got to give you something. We've got to give you something to make you vote for us. It's got to be transactional, as opposed to saying we want your life to be better and we'll implement policies that will make it safer and more prosperous for everybody, allow you to compete. Yeah, I completely agree. Why do we think that black voters don't want what all voters want? Uh, economic opportunity, safe neighborhoods, better schools, affordable housing. Uh, this idea that we, we have to come up with some gimmick to pay you off. By the way, the poll will give you $25,000 to buy a house, regardless of, of your ability to uh, service a mortgage in the future. We tried that under Bill Clinton, remember? Yep. Andrew Cuomo was the secretary of HUD. It was called the subprime mortgage uh, uh, disaster. It not only destroyed the housing industry, it caused an entire economic meltdown. So we tried that and it didn't work. But it is uh, the Democrat playbook. You're absolutely right to try to buy these votes with a program or a grant or funding. Uh, I don't think it will work. So I want to ask you about something that I, I is a pet peeve of mine. The Democrats argue that people who enter this country illegally, i.e. break a law to come into a, the country, and then we give them a free driver's license, that the, 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 those folks will stop at the line of registering to vote because, well, that's illegal. So you'll break the law to come into this country. We give you a free driver's license, but then God forbid you won't vote because, well, that's illegal. Well, then Glenn Youngkin and other folks, but Glenn Youngkin, my governor here in Virginia, cleans up the voter rolls and says these non-citizens need to be taken off the voter laws. And the Biden DOJ sues Virginia. Now, how do you, what other conclusion could you possibly come to at this point to say that the Democrats truly want you to vote? Yeah, I, I talked to a lawyer I know about this last night because I'm not a lawyer. I can't understand even what argument they could make. The Constitution is clear. Uh, the state laws are clear. You have to be a U.S. citizen to vote. So what is their argument that you should not re you'd remove these non-citizens from the voting rolls. Uh, it's hard for me to even imagine what argument they make. But uh, as you know, they've gone to court in multiple states, like Arizona as well, to, to fight people who are not eligible to vote based on their citizenship from being on the rolls. When I said this uh, in a speech in Jacksonville the other day, that I thought there were a million, at least a million, uh, ineligible voters, people who are dead, people who moved, people who are not citizens, uh, people who never existed at all that needed to be cleaned from the rolls. I was attacked for staging, a, planning to stage a coup. That's how crazy these people are. No, the only people who should vote are people who are legally eligible to vote. Uh, I, I give Glenn Youngkin huge credit for making this move. We need to have a free, fair, honest, transparent election. If we do, I think Donald Trump will win. But don't you agree? I mean, my position is if you put up all these roadblocks to ensuring that only U.S. citizens do vote, then one needs to question your motives. If you keep telling me that you want to give them a free driver's license, that you don't want us to clean up voter rolls, then it's got to be that your intention is that they actually do vote. I don't think there's any question about that. I think the Democrats want illegals to vote here in Florida. You can go to the Motor Vehicles Department and register to vote. No one asks you for proof of citizenship. No one, no one asks you to prove uh, that you're actually eligible. And you go on the voter rolls. It, it's very, and that's the largest single uh, source of new registrants uh, in the state. So we, I think we have to conclude, as you say, the Democrats want illegals to vote because they think they will vote uh, for the folks who let them in the country illegally and who are giving them uh, uh, in New York state, for example, uh, a, a pre-packaged uh, credit card, a cell phone, uh, a place to live. I mean, uh, American citizens, particularly seniors and veterans have been thrown out of housing in New York so that we can house illegals. None of this makes any sense. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.